<laughs> Hello and welcome to Parley Studies on the Learn Parley channel. Now, in all the grammar tutorials so far, we've never stopped to ask, what is Parley? So that's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to look at what the word means and where it comes from. Now let me start off by saying, inevitably in this video, I'll stray into some controversial areas. My intention of course is not to cause upset to anyone. I'm not advocating one view over another, and I'm certainly not trying to prove or stress in an opinion. Ok, that said, now let's get on and ask the question, what is Parley? The obvious answer, and I'm sure you wouldn't be here if you didn't know, is that Parley is the language in which the scriptures of the Theravada school of Buddhism has been preserved and passed down. That's true, but when we say Pali is a language, most languages are named either after a population or a region, but we have no evidence for a region called Pali or even a population of Pali speakers. So what's going on? Well, it's only really in comparatively modern times that the word Pali has been used to refer to the name of a language. It's only really in the last 200 years, and in the West, that the language of the Theravada canon has been referred to as Pali. The first use of the term in Western literature is attributed to Simon de la Lubre, a French envoy to the King of Siam, modern-day Thailand, in 1687. In a later publication where he gives details of his travels, he mentions that Pali is the name being used by the local monks for the language of the Theravadan texts. And this caught on in the West, where it was widely used in writings of the 19th century. In fact, nowhere in the Tapitika is the term Pali used to refer to a language. Even the spelling of the word Pali seems to vary, sometimes with a short A and sometimes with a retroflex L. To this day, there's no standard spelling of the term. And the subject of what Pali is and where does it come from has actually caused some quite intense debate among scholars in the West. It seems that Pali is a contraction of the term Pali Basha. This first appears in the commentaries of Buddha Goza, written probably after the 4th century. But it's not used to name a language. Instead, it points to the scriptures the texts of the Tipitika, the words of the Buddha, as opposed to the commentaries, the explanations, or talks on meaning. And we know it was used in this way, at least up until the 6th or 7th centuries, in Sri Lanka. So what does it mean? Well, Bhasha means speech or language, and in Sanskrit, Pali means a line or row. So it can be taken as the language of the text. And it seems at some point, this term has been misunderstood to mean that Pali was the name of the language itself. And the Sanskrit noun Pali is derived from the verbal root pa, meaning to preserve or guard. So the implication is that the text preserved the teachings of the Buddha. It's also been suggested that the word Pali is connected with pata, meaning a passage of text, or to be read aloud. So we could infer the verses for recital. OK, so that gives us some understanding about what the word Pali means. But if it's not the name of a language, what does the Tipitaka say the language was? Well, you probably won't be surprised to learn that the Buddha didn't actually say which language he was speaking. He merely refers to his teachings as being Dharma. There are some passages in the Vinaya, the Rules of Conduct, which refer to Ariyaka, meaning Aryan, as a designation for the spoken language. But this could be just a general term for the dialects of northern India. Now again, the commentaries come in and fill this void and characterize the language spoken by the Buddha as Magadhi Niruti the Magadhi way of speaking, and Magadha Basha, which is the language of Magadha. Magadha is the name of the province 
where the Buddha spent much of his teaching career, and Magadhi is the dialect spoken in that province. And the Theravada tradition equates the language which the Buddha spoke with Magadhi, which is the same as what we now call Pali. But I think it's worth pointing out that there were actually a number of different versions of the canon assembled across India by different sects of monks. So as well as the Theravada canon, we can speak of the Mahasangika canon and the Savastivada canon, and these various canons have each been written down in a different language. However, the Theravada canon, written in Pali, is now the only complete canon still in existence, but we know of the others from remnants which still exist in the Chinese Agamas. Okay, so we now might ask, well, what's the physical evidence for Pali? You might be surprised to learn that most of our physical evidence for Pali and the Theravada canon is astonishingly recent. Far more recent than, let's say, the evidence for biblical texts. Hardly any Pali manuscripts in existence today are more than about 500 years old, with the vast majority being less than 300 years. This is because traditionally Pali has been written on manuscripts made from palm leaves. And these are threaded together on strings to make books. But being an organic material, it doesn't last well in humid climates, maybe only a century or two. And this tradition still exists today. Palms are harvested and split, sized, dried, smoothed and then the finished leaf is etched with a stylus. Finally, a charcoal wash is applied to give a clear inscription. And I'm told that this soot-based ink is often made from the cremation ash of past monks and nuns. So the oldest palm leaf manuscript we have today that uses Pali consists in just four fragments of the Vinaya, which were found in Kathmandu, Nepal, and are believed to date to around the 9th century. Whereas the oldest Buddhist manuscripts that we have were found in pots buried in the region of Gandhara. These were written on birch bark and miraculously date to the first half of the 1st century. But this incredible find is actually written in a Gandhari Prakrit, and not Pali. The earliest archaeological evidence for the existence of Pali is actually not palm leaf manuscript, but some inscriptions on gold plate, which were found at Sisetra, which was one of the Pew city-states of ancient Burma, now Myanmar. These have become known as the Golden Pali Texts, and I believe that they've now been dated to the mid-4th or early 5th centuries. Interestingly, these are in a script which is similar to the Brahmi script of mainland India, which suggests that early Buddhist influence came from mainland India rather than from Sri Lanka. And that's where the archaeological evidence ends. We only have physical evidence for the existence of Pali dating back to the 4th or 5th centuries. But what about the orthodox Theravada perspective? Well, let's now take a closer look at this in more detail. Well, of course, Buddhist literature begins with the instructions given by the Buddha himself to his disciples, and even during his lifetime these were being committed to memory. Then, after his passing, or Parinirvana, his disciples held several meetings, or councils, and a corpus of teachings and monastic rules were compiled in a style appropriate for memorising. Now, according to the Chronicles of Sri Lanka, around 250 BC, the great Indian king Ashoka having established an empire from coast to coast, convened a great council of monks at Pataliputta, the capital of the new empire. Now, at this third council, amongst other things, it was decided to send learned monks as emissaries to foreign lands in order to spread the Dharma. These envoys travelled as far as Greece, North Africa, Burma, and according to the chronicles, Ashoka sent his own son, Mahinda, 
and it was Mahinda who took the Buddhist canon, which presumably he'd memorised, from the kingdom of Magadha to Sri Lanka. Now we don't know exactly which language Mahinda conversed in, but the Sri Lankans clearly understood that he represented the Magadha Empire, and therefore he must be speaking Magadhi, and so Magadhi becomes the language of the canon, which today we call Pali. But we have to recognise that the Mauryan Empire, or Greater Magadha, had grown enormously between the time of the Buddha and the time of Ashoka. And it's also important to realise that the teachings were still being passed down orally. Monks would chant the teachings in order to memorise them. It wasn't until around 50 BC that according to the Sri Lankan chronicles, the teachings were first written down. And even then, this was merely just to protect the teachings from loss, whilst the favoured method of preservation was still memorisation through chanting. And this is how the situation remained, until centuries later the island of Sri Lanka was swept by war, and so the canon of the Theravadans was taken for safety to both Burma and Siam, modern-day Myanmar and Thailand. And for most Buddhists, this represents the true historical account. However, linguistic analysis by Western scholarship has cast doubt on the equating of present-day Pali with Magadhi, the language of the Magadha province. Why is this? Well, the great Indian king Ashoka did archaeology a great favour by carving edicts onto stone pillars and rocks around the borders of his territory in what is thought to be local dialects of those particular regions in the 3rd century BC. And although there is no attested dialect with all the features of present-day Pali, it shares some common features with both the Ashokan inscription at Girna in the west and at Hatigumpa in the east. Now, all of the Ashokan edicts are actually in very similar dialects of what is called Prakrit, and the inscriptions can be arranged into three groups. The eastern dialects, which are seen to represent the official language of the Magadha Empire, the western dialects, and the northwestern of Gandhara. Thus the inscriptions of Ashoka give us a very rough spectrum of dialects which existed in the 3rd century BC. And although nothing like a real dialectical map, it has allowed scholars to distinguish the linguistic features of the dialects present in northern India, only a century or so after the passing of the Buddha. And when we compare these to present-day Pali, it turns out to be unusual in that it contains both eastern and western Prakrit features, with the majority belonging to the western group, and not eastern as we might expect if Pali and Magadhi were one in the same. For instance, the Western group has O and long A as declension endings for nominative singular nouns in the singular and the plural, whereas those endings on the Eastern group, although they exist in Pali, they're actually much more rare. This has led to the conclusion that Pali, as we have it today, is not actually a single language, but is a composite or mixture of peculiar dialectical forms with far more alternative endings than would be expected from a single spoken dialect. And this fact has led to a range of opinions and various attempts to locate Pali on the North Indian dialectical map. Many scholars still hold that Pali was in fact Old Magadhi, but took on Western characteristics as the empire of Ashoka grew towards the West. It's even been suggested that Pali is a contracted form of Patali, being the dialect of Pataliputta, the capital of the Magadha Empire. But as we've already seen, the term Pali was not used as the name of her language until very late. Other scholars have stressed the fact that the Buddha was born and educated in Kosala, and so would have spoken Kosalan, which was also a great province, although it was later eclipsed by Magadha. In fact, recent analysis of the canon reveals that more than half of the sermons by the Buddha were actually outside of the Magadha province. And some have even placed Pali in the far west, 
as a dialect of Ujjain, relying not merely on the connection with the Girnar Edict, but also that Ashoka himself, as a prince, was viceroy to the province of Wanti. He married there, and his son Mahinda was both born and educated there, before he set off with the scriptures to Sri Lanka. However, others have suggested Kalinga in modern-day Orissa, Taxila in the far northwest, even Kausambi, central to the empire. It's also commonly stated that the Buddha would have known and taught in several different dialects, and that Pali today reflects this mixture. It's even been suggested that Pali was never a spoken language, but a form of artificial, even cobbled-together composite language, which was purely used for religious texts. The fact is that Pali is exclusively a Buddhist language. Anyway, I think it's safe to say that Western scholarship has not arrived at a consensus on this issue. Okay, at this point, I think it's worth stepping back to discuss another theory, perhaps even more controversial, and that is Proto-Indo-European. It's been long recognised that certain languages share a common ancestor, especially amongst the languages of Europe and of northern India and Persia. And when Westerners began travelling towards the east, they noted similar spellings of cognates, that is, words with the same meaning, similar methods of conjugation of verbs, and similar rules of syntax between the languages of Europe and the languages of India. And this connection is quite evident in simple words, like names for the parts of the body, pronouns, and numbers. Two, three, three, two, 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 By comparing common elements of these cognates and assessing how sounds have shifted over time and distance, it's possible to work backwards and reconstruct once lost ancestors. In fact, linguists have now reconstructed entire languages, and these are called proto-languages, and the word roots are marked with an asterisk to show that they're purely theoretical. And it's believed that the European and the Indian languages share a single common ancestor, which is called Proto-Indo-European. Even though this is all theoretical, there are no inscriptions to attest for any of the proto-languages, some linguists believe that Proto-Indo-European was a real language. And place its source somewhere on the Russian steppe, where it spread both eastwards and westwards, taking horse domestication and chariot technology along with it. So, if we play this forward, Proto-Indo-European started on the Russian steppe, then divided as it spread both towards the east and the west. Eventually the Indo-Aryan branch formed, and Proto-Indic became the root of all northern Indian languages of today. Now I wish to acknowledge here that this is quite a controversial area. Theories based on linguistic techniques alone are always tentative, and the archaeological evidence for this movement of people isn't substantial. There are some who argue that this migration never took place, and they actually posit an out-of-India theory for the spread of language. In support of the migration theory is the relatively new discipline of archaeogenetics, which is the DNA analysis of archaeological remains, and this has been rewriting prehistory all over the world. Indeed, recent evidence from this field suggests that there have been several migrations into India, but it's still a very active area for debate. Anyway, according to this theory, Proto-Indic, also called Proto-Indo-Aryan, bears all the features of a Proto-Indo-European language, such as eight declension cases, three verb moods, indicative, optative and imperative, and so on. And as it penetrated into northern India, it met with pre-existing languages, probably Dravidian, and it absorbed some of their features, such as the retroflex consonant sounds, which don't exist in Proto-Indo-European. And this then became the basis for all the Indic languages of northern India today. 
So you may see the development of Indo-Aryan is often split into three stages, Old, Middle and New. Old Indo-Aryan is the language of the Rig Veda, sometimes called Vedic. Next come the Prakrits, some of which we've already seen with the Edicts of Ashoka. And this is a class of closely related dialects, which are basically simpler spoken dialects which deviate from Sanskrit proper. To this group belongs Pali, and also a later development, which was Arda Magadhi, or Half Magadhi, and was possibly used for commerce and diplomacy in the Greater Magadha area. And this is also the language in which the texts of the Jaina tradition have also come to be preserved. Now, although it's commonly assumed that the Prakrits were a direct continuation from Vedic, a number of morphological features suggest that although related, they may actually be sisters to rather than daughters of Vedic. Classical Sanskrit, however, is a direct continuation of Rig Vedic, the phonology and grammar of which became standardized and fixed by the grammarian Parnini sometime after the 4th century BC. In fact, it was Panini who coined the terms Samskrita, meaning refined or purified, as opposed to Prakrita, meaning natural or of the people. But it seems to have taken some time for Samskrita to become the preferred language of priests and the royal classes. In fact, the Mauryan dynasty of Ashoka seemed to prefer Prakrita and later Arda Magadhi. It wasn't until around the time of the Common Era that classical Sanskrit, as it's also known, began to flourish. And it went on to influence Prakrit's development, including that of Pali, through a process known as Sanskritization, which is a tendency to drift towards Sanskrit spelling and phonetics. Finally, the Middle Indo-Aryan dialects developed into those of the New, which are present in northern India today, such as Hindi and Urdu. And what Panini did for Sanskrit, others have done for Pali, standardizing and formalizing the language. Although there are probably earlier works, there are three principal grammars still in existence today. The oldest is attributed to Kakayana from Sri Lanka sometime around the 6th century AD. Then Moggallana's works, also in Sri Lanka, around the 12th century. And a work called Sadaniti in Burma, also sometime in the 12th century. Once the Pali grammarians had begun to classify and categorize the features of Pali, it was inevitable that this would affect the scribes, those actually doing the copying out. And it has been said, perhaps with some justification, that the Pali of the canon as we have it today is a reflection of the Pali of the 12th century, when the influence of the Pali grammarians was at its highest. So perhaps it's not that surprising that the Pali that we have today doesn't directly correspond to any of the Prakrits from the Ashokan period of India. In fact, Pali seems to have died out as a literary language in mainland India sometime around the 14th century, so just at the time as it was coming to the fore in other regions. And even though Pali probably developed as a language from one of the Ashokan Prakrits, the bulk of Pali literature today not only dates from a much later period, but was mainly produced outside of the subcontinent altogether, in Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, and even Cambodia. In the end, all we have to go on is the language that has survived, and knowing what the words mean, and how and why they mean what they mean, is perhaps now the most important task for a student of Pali. Well, thank you for listening. There are plenty of links down in the description to the various subjects covered in this video. This has been an introduction to my other Pali language grammar tutorials. If you want to follow this channel, then please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon else you won't get all of the updates. And finally, for more information on Pali grammar, please visit my blog at palistudies.blogspot.com.